afternoon, everyone. I'm Bian Bagi, Program Officer and Landscape Coordinator of for National of, of Forest Foundation Philippines, and I will be your host for today. Thank you for being with us in this fifth installment of our monthly webinar series called Understory. Today, we will be talking about the importance of trees in cities in the Philippine context, including its management and ways of doing public engagement. When the foundation started its grant making process, most of the support was directed to the reforestation and conservation of the tropical lowland evergreen rainforest, particularly in areas where dipterocarps were once abundant. The current program plan of the foundation, particularly in the adoption of the landscape approach, urban forests are key in ensuring that the reach to the root of the mangroves, forest conservation and protection efforts are in place. The objectives of this webinar are to share the importance of urban forests and biodiversity, present pathways on urban forests and biodiversity program, and encourage stakeholders to work with us, apply a grant on urban forests and biodiversity. Before we start, here are some house rules for a good webinar experience. As participants to the webinar, you will have restricted audio and video access. Communication may be possible through the comment section on Facebook. Please leave your questions and comments and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Joining me today in this webinar is landscape architect James Christopher Buño, a member of Philippine Association of Landscape Architects. PALA is a professional organization responsible for the advancement of the profession as an instrument of service in improving the quality of life within a better natural and built environment, and advocates the creation and management of ecologically balanced, habitable, aesthetically pleasing environments. We will be joined as well by Mr. David Justin Pless, currently the Vice President of the Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society and researcher at UP Diliman Biodiversity Research Laboratory. PNPCSI is a non-government organization whose mission is to generate knowledge and share in the conservation of Philippine native plants and their habitats. They will be sharing their insights on urban forest management, appreciation for urban forest and urban biodiversity that can inspire us to take collective action in conserving and improving our urban forests. For some of you who might be new in this webinar series, let me share some information about the Forest Foundation. Forest Foundation Philippines, formerly called the Philippine Tropical Forest Conservation Foundation, is a non-profit organization that provides grants and technical assistance to empower the people to protect and conserve the forests. The foundation was established in 2002 under two bilateral agreements between the governments of the United States of America and the Philippines. Now on its second Tropical Forest Conservation Agreement, the foundation crafted its results framework for 2017 to 2021 to provide guidance in the grant making process. Under the current results framework, majority of the support will be provided to four focal landscapes, namely Sierra Madre, Palawan, Summer Leyte, and Bukidnon and Misamis Oriental. However, support can still be provided to areas outside of the focal landscapes through the focus grants. The foundation adopted the four outcomes that we believe should be considered in sustainable forest management. These are the growth forests, wherein projects related to reforestation, foot patrolling, among others, are anchored. Grow livelihoods, which support forest-dependent communities in developing community enterprises consistent with the sustainable line, landscape approach. Grow partnerships, providing support to forest management bodies, BFMPOs, and other relevant stakeholders to manage their forest resources. And lastly, grow advocates, supporting knowledge generation and publications, community awareness, learning sessions, and dialogues. Today, I will be discussing urban forests, its importance, value, and role in a healthy city environment, and the foundation's urban biodiversity, forest, and health program. But first, let's define urban forests. 
yes, there are indeed forests in the seas. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations define urban forests as systems systems comprising of woodlands, groups of trees and individual trees located in urban and peri-urban areas, which may include forests, street trees, trees in parks and gardens, and trees in derelict corners. Where are these forests located? Let's take a virtual tour using Google Earth. Here is an aerial view of NCR. As we can see, the majority of the green vegetation is located at the outskirts of the metro, but there are still green patches of green when we zoom in. Under the definition of FAO, they further classified urban forests to five major types. Let's have a virtual tour and locate some of which in NCR. Very urban forests and woodlands is a forest type surrounding towns and cities that can provide goods and services such as wood, fiber, fruit, other non-wood forest products such as clean water, recreation, and tourism. Can you guess which part this is? It's the La Mesa Watershed Reserve in Quezon City. I believe this one is a giveaway, a haven for plantito, plantita, a go-to for Zumba and jogging, occasional concerts, and a lot more. This is the Quezon City Memorial Circle. City parks and urban forests are greater than half hectare, large urban or district parks with a variety of lawn cover and at least partly equipped with facilities for leisure and recreation. Another urban forest type is trees on streets or in public squares. Linear tree population, small groups of trees and individual trees in squares and parking lots and on streets. Did you know that this avenue is lined up with a species that can be found in our 25 centavos? This is the White Plains Avenue near Camp Aguinaldo. Have you been to this side of the metro? Paco Park is a recreational garden and was once Manila's municipal cemetery built by the Dominicans during the Spanish colonial period. This park has been a popular venue for weddings and receptions. Packet Park and Garden with Trees is an urban forest type that has less than half a hectare in total land area. These are often equipped with facilities for recreation, leisure, and private gardens and green spaces. Last but not the least, which is rather unpopular, are other green spaces with trees. An example would be the Libingan ng mga bayan. This includes urban agricultural plots, sport grounds, vacant plots, lawns, river banks, open fields, cemeteries, and botanical gardens. By now, we can say that there are still remaining urban forests within NCR. Urban forest contains biodiversity. Urban biodiversity is the variety and richness of living organisms, including genetic variation and habitat diversity found in and on the edge of human settlements. Last year, one of our partners, the Ateneo Wild, in partnership with an artist, Ms. Inya De Vera, launched the City Wild Urban Biodiversity Flashcards. This flashcard features urban wildlife and biodiversity concepts for young learners to know and appreciate urban biodiversity. This learning material is downloadable and printable for free through our website. As a person living or working in the cities, what can urban forests bring us? Diverse trees, species with varying height and shape can buffer noise and can intercept air pollutants coming from mobile sources. Urban forests provide clean water. Take the case of the La Mesa watershed. Urban forests cools the environment. If you go inside an urban forest or green parks, you would notice that it is a lot cooler inside than outside the park. If you have been to the school grounds of Ateneo, Miriam College, and UP Diliman, or the Katipunan Corridor, you may see native tree species. And if you are lucky and keen enough, you may see various fauna from snakes, bats, birds, and others. 
urban forests and access to urban forests can improve one's physical and mental health. In a study conducted in 2015, it was observed that green spaces are associated with better self-perceived general and mental health across different degrees of urbanization, socioeconomic statuses, and genders. Professor Cecil Ponainidaik of the University of British Columbia proposed the 330-300 rule with regards to urban forestry and urban greening. The rule is that every citizen should be able to see at least three trees of decent size from their home. Each neighborhood should have at least 30% tree cover and that residents should be at least 300 meters away from the nearest park for green spaces. The percentage of tree cover can provide a cooling effect on nearby buildings and residential areas. Access to green spaces or urban forests can encourage us to be more active physically. Plans and policies on urban forests. Here are existing plans related to urban biodiversity and urban forestry. Under the Philippine Biodiversity Strategic Action Plan for 2015 to 2028, Target 6 envisioned that by 2028, there will be a 5% increase in the proportion of green spaces in the five largest cities, including Quezon City. The main implementing and monitoring agency for this plan is the DNR Biodiversity Management Bureau. In 2018, BNB released Technical Bulletin 2018-02, Procedures in the Conduct of Urban Biodiversity to support the development of City Biodiversity Index, or CBI. CBI is a monitoring tool that will be the basis of actions in integrating the city's biodiversity in the local development plans. The Philippine Master Plan for Climate Resilient Forestry Development for 2016 to 2028 of FMB provides support for urban forestry. Under the local government code, local government units have the mandate to establish tree parks, green belts, and similar forest development projects. Through the program, DNR can support LGUs in implementing activities such as development of nurseries, tree growing activities, development of mini forests, and conduct of IEC activities regarding the importance of urban forests and urban biodiversity. Consistent with the results framework of the foundation for 2017 to 21, and cognizant of the need for programs related to urban biodiversity, the Urban Biodiversity Forest and Health Program was developed. Under this program, support will be provided to promote the good effects of forest and human health and well-being. Here are some of the eligible activities that may be supported under this grant. Under Grow, Ad, Grow Forest is the mapping assessment of forest baiting therapy areas, mapping assessment of zoonotic threats and risks, expanding green spaces in urban areas. Uh, funding support for feasibility studies and developing forest bathing or therapy as an ecotourism package and or community-based enterprise, forging partnerships with stakeholders and various sectors, and capacity building and management planning. And lastly, knowledge management systems, communications, and advocacies on forest and health. To date, here are some of the initiatives that the foundation supported. In 2019, the foundation supported a capacity building on forest baiting for DNRBMB, Philippine Institute of Environment Planners, and PALA. The concepts and health benefits of forest baiting were discussed and the participants get to experience firsthand forest baiting. Forest baiting, or connecting with nature through the five senses is an immersion with nature. It was proven to provide health benefits such as reduced blood pressure, lowered stress levels, better immune system, and improved mental health, among others. Forest bathing program includes pre- and post-health check, exercise, and meditation. It also includes mindfulness walk with several stops, allotted to heighted one senses, and at the end of such program is a healthy meal prepared by a local community. Early this year, the foundation, together with its partners, DNRBNB, 
EIEP and PALA has signed an MOU to support and implement an urban forest bathing program in order to contribute to the achievement of the PBSAP target on urban biodiversity. Under this MOU, activities such as the development of policy guidelines on urban forest bathing, development of urban forest bathing program, among others, will be supported. While most forest bathing sites around abroad are usually in areas that are two to three hours away from the city center, we want to argue that forest bathing programs can still be possible within urban forests. One of our neighbor countries who have a forest and welfare program is South Korea. In 2019, during the Asia-Pacific Week celebration, a presentation on how forest welfare is integrated in people's life cycle was presented. Communing with nature is encouraged from an early age and creating parks and green spaces has been a trend. With the current pandemic and restrictions in mobility, access to forests and outdoors is limited. Thus, there is a renewed call to maintain and increase our existing urban forests. Most of the remaining green spaces in NCR are within Quezon City. Today, we are fortunate to have as our source person, landscape architect James Christopher Boone. James is the acting director of the Diliman Environmental Management Office. Prior to his current appointment, he was the acting director of the UP Diliman Campus Maintenance Office. He is a landscape architect with almost 10 years of combined experience in landscape design, construction, maintenance, and management in both the private and public sector. With his presentation entitled Urban Forest Management, Principles and Policies, without further ado, let us all welcome landscape architect James Christopher Bunyan. Thank you very much, Diane. It's my pleasure to be part of this activity by the Forest Foundation Philippines. And I'm glad to be here to be able to share our experiences in UP Diliman and also learn from our uh, fellow speakers and from uh, the inputs to be uh, contributed by some of our audience. So um, I will be presenting on our experience on urban forest management in UP Diliman. And uh, for my part in this activity, I will uh, try to uh, walk you through the following topics. First of all, uh, UP Diliman as an urban forest and a home of urban forest. And then uh, I will try to share our experiences on the processes uh, involved in managing UP Diliman's uh, trees. And, also share some of the policies that we are implementing in the university. And then uh, towards the end, uh, summarize what I've shared and also present the prospects that we are uh, facing here in the university in terms of urban forest management. So for the purpose of this discussion, uh, I will be using the definition of urban forestry uh, by Dr. Guido Cucho Meister in a 1998 working paper where he mentioned that urban forestry is considered as planning, management, and conservation of trees, forests, and related vegetation to create or add value to the local community in, or in an urban area. I believe this very much complements the uh, definition on urban forests provided by Diane a while ago. So when Diane invited me to speak on urban forest management for this activity, I was a bit um, reluctant because I didn't know that uh, urban forest uh, is a basically a loose term that can actually apply to the characteristics, environmental qualities of UP Diliman and many of our spaces in the city. So noon kasi iniisip ko, when you say forest, kailangan makapal yung tree cover. But hindi pala ganon in the case of urban forests. So loosely applying the definition of Dr. Kucho Meister, the 429 hectare UP Diliman campus is an urban forest and one of the few remaining green spaces of its size in Metro Manila. It is very expansive uh, compared to the rest of the spaces in Metro Manila that you can actually 
identify it from a satellite photo. And uh, yan, nakikita nyo naman dun sa picture at yung uh, gumagalaw na circle kung nasaan yung UP Diliman. So another value of UP Diliman, I think, is that it's one of the few remaining public spaces, publicly accessible spaces of its size. Yung iba pang mga mas malalaking patches are actually the high-end subdivisions that we have here in Metro Manila and which are not readily accessible to the public. So while relatively vegetated, this is a closer uh, satellite view of the campus. Uh, compared to the rest of the concrete jungle that is Metro Manila, the density of vegetation and tree cover within the campus also varies. So some of the areas with the most tree covers include the UP Arboretum on the upper left portion, the UP Lagoon uh, on the, at the center or at the heart of the campus, and the Science Complex Arboretum. Uh, at the southern part of the campus. So UP Diliman may also be considered as a home of urban forests. So as mentioned by Dayan, having relatively significant tree cover in an urban area is part of what makes UP Diliman, Diliman's unique character and also its place identity. So sa mga nakakita ng background ko, siguro kung nakapunta na kayo dito, you will uh, immediately recognize this as one of the more popular uh, parts of the university. This is actually uh, the famous uh, tree, the famous academic oval lined by ac acacias no? uh, at the part near the sunken garden. So kung mapapansin nyo, this was taken before the pandemic. May mga maliliit na tao pa dun sa likod na nagja-jogging. So this is one of the sites that we really miss here in UP Diliman, no? seeing people interact with the natural environment. So it also provides various benefits, such as providing an environment conducive to learning. So dun sa picture, makikita nyo, nakatingala silang lahat because this is actually uh, one of the bird watching activities of the UP Wild. No? And then where the people learn uh, not only about the different types of birds present in the campus, but also learn how the, uh, protecting the environment benefits uh, these birds and provides us with these wonderful experiences. So aside from that, aside from providing environment conducive to learning, so it also provides habitat a variety of flora and fauna, which are rarely found elsewhere in Metro Manila. So the bird there is actually the Kolasisi, if I'm not mistaken. So it's uh, the smallest uh, species of uh, parrot native to the Philippines or endemic to the Philippines. So we have that kind of bird here in the campus because of the quality of our natural environment. So, but it also has its challenges. So which may be intrinsic to the characteristics of certain trees in the campus or may be a result of the trees being exposed to the impacts of the urban environment. So as we all know, most of the trees originally grew from undisturbed forest, but with, uh, with their existence, with human activity there are, and development, there are cases when uh, such a uh, uh, such coexistence creates unfavorable conditions to the detriment of the trees. No? So what you are seeing now in the slide, dun sa inset, is actually an example of what commonly happens here in UP during uh, typhoons with uh, strong winds. So many trees get uprooted. And on the, big, the bigger picture, where you see the tree uh, which fell on the middle of the road, that is actually a tree that succumbed to uh, uh, center rot, no? uh, because this is actually an exotic species, the fire tree. So if you will see, you won't, uh, just looking from outside the tree, you won't notice anything wrong. So it did not manifest any uh, sign that uh, there is damage inside. No? But eventually, uh, it just... Uh, succumb to the damage because uh, yun nga, hindi na strong yung loob niya, no? nabubulok na yung loob niya because of the, well, the humidity of the, of the environment. No? So these trees include, this, this of course, so ito nga yung mga trees falling or being uprooted by typhoons. Uh, yung tree damages caused by pests, moisture, and human activity. 
And of course, there are also times when there are conflicts you know, between uh, the trees and the uh, development that uh, goes on in the campus. So one of the uh, most uh, recent is uh, the uh, reclassification of a portion of the UP Arboretum you know, to make space for a public hospital. So these are some of the issues being faced in as far as urban forest management is concerned in UP Diliman. So how do we manage uh, UP Diliman's trees? So I'll start with some of the processes that goes in with the management. So UP Diliman manages its tree primarily through the ground services division of the campus maintenance office. So uh, being a very huge educational institution, so we really need to have our own uh, maintenance office and a ground services division to uh, take care of the campus grounds. So this includes also providing care for the trees and also protection and the necessary um, tree care activities. So most of the work involves pruning, protection, and at times irrigation, especially in the case of young trees during the dry spells. You know? In addition to that, UP Diliman also employs private specialists to perform regular and preventive tree care services in areas frequented by the public. You know? So uh, the level of uh, tree care and the form of tree care that we provide also depends on uh, the use of the spaces. So in this picture, you will see the pruning crew of the campus maintenance office uh, trying to prune a significant portion of one of the trees because as you may notice, it is actually leaning already and is in danger of falling uh, to the road and possibly hitting uh, a one of uh, food stalls at the opposite side of the road. So we're trying to lessen the weight of the tree. So this is actually the most possible uh, reason for the leaning of the tree is the development of the road. So you can see this is a new road development, which most, which most probably uh, disturb the root system and the foundation of the tree. So uh, these photos are photos of our uh, landscape uh, maintenance contractor. So trying to uh, remove some of the uh, dried leaves of the palm trees. This is along the University Avenue. And also uh, doing preventive pruning. So trying to prune the uh, rotten branches of the acacia trees along the academic oval to prevent injury that might uh, happen to those walking or jogging below these trees. So Aside from the processes which make up the day-to-day -day activities involved in the management of UP Diliman's trees, I will also present some of the policies developed and implemented in UP Diliman related to its management as an urban forest. So in 2009, the year following the UP Centennial, so UP was founded in 1908 and the UP Centennial was in 2008. So then UP President Emerlinda Roman issued memorandum PERR 09-024 on the native trees policy for UP campuses in the next century. So this basically instructs chancellors or the heads of the various UP campuses all uh, throughout the nation to discontinue planting of the planting of introduced and exotic species for purposes of landscaping and commemoration and implement the planting of new or additional trees using only indigenous or endemic species with an exception given to exotic plants planted for experimental purposes and limited commercial tree farms that are not part of the campus landscaping. So uh, with this memo, it basically says that from here on, uh, trees that will be planted for landscaping purposes should be the native trees. So a list of more of over 190 native trees was released shortly after the issuance of the memorandum. So interestingly, uh, 10 years after, in, in 2019, our current president, Daniel L. Concepcion, issued Administrative Order Number PDLC 19-02, 
as a supplement to the previous memo, and uh, which this basically expands the exemption for planting exotics for sufficiently justifiable causes. No? And in consideration of factors such as compatibility with adjacent vegetation, uh, example would be non-competing and non-invasive, aesthetics, resiliency, heritage, and such other characteristics that will justify their place among native species. So basically, this expands the margin of exemption for uh, non-natives. No? Uh, on a different um, matter, so this one, the guidelines in 2012, uh, Chancellor Cesar Saloma of UP Diliman issued memorandum number CAS 12-038 on the guidelines and conditions for tree planting in UP Diliman. This is one of the most useful uh, policies that I was able to uh, use back when I was the head of the campus maintenance office, uh, primarily because Lots of people want to plant trees in UP Diliman and uh, for mostly for commemoration or for uh, environmental uh, related uh, activities, advocacies. But uh, what's important to know is that uh, there is a need to uh, control the tree planting in UP Diliman in such a way that uh, the trees will be properly cared for, trees that will be planted will be properly cared for and not uh, go to waste. And also that, so that we can ensure that the places being planted by trees will not in the future uh, conflict with uh, future developments of the university. So uh, as an educational institution, it is inevitable for the university to uh, accommodate and embark on infrastructure development to support its uh, mandate. No? So basically, uh, these uh, guidelines reaffirm the implementation of the 2009 Native Trees Policy of President uh, Roman and basically uh, gives focus on quantity over quality. So it established controls against uh, what we call indiscriminate and mass tree planting activities. So, which most of the time either fails to prosper due to, again, insufficient maintenance. So, there are times when uh, organizations would come to us and they, they will say, tell us that they want to plant 100 trees to commemorate or to uh, symbolize 100 something. You know? And uh, the problem with that is uh, we don't really have the capacity to take in additional 100 trees and ensure that they grow. So... Uh, these uh, guidelines help us control that, uh, that issue. No? So it also prescribes the uh, uh, requirements for those interested in, in conducting tree planting activities, which are aimed at more mindful and environmental, environmentally sound practice of tree planting. So if you will notice, me medyo maliit lang yung fonts nung ano, uh, uh, scan copy ko nung policy, but makikita nyo dyan that in-identify in na yung uh, kung kailan uh, i-accommodate ang mga proposed tree planting activities, anong season, and then saan-saan lang pwede magtanim ng mga puno, and even up to the detail of ano yung specifications ng digging holes, ano yung garden soil na gagamitin, the source of the planting materials, and maximum number of uh, trees to be planted. No? So, there, that's one of the most uh, useful policies that we've had. And then the most recent one is uh, the Biodiversity Management Handbook, which is, uh, which is still yet to be released, but have been has been favorably endorsed by Chancellor Michael Tan to Chancellor Fidel Nemenzo. So in 2018, Chancellor Michael Tan created the Technical Working Group on Biodiversity Management. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary group involving uh, UP faculty and administrators of the natural sciences and the environment and the concerned offices. So one of the major outputs of the technical working group is to create a biodiversity management handbook. It will be a reference of members of the UP community. So it basically ensures the protection of campus biodiversity in spatial development, institutional operations, and public use of campus space. So if you'll see the uh, 
that uh, pages uh, showing the contents, you'll see that it basically is uh, framed on three uh, biodiversity principles, which we believe should be uh, 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 implemented in UP Diliman. And uh, different uh, aspects and contexts uh, relating to these uh, principles that were as uh, policies need to be provided or guidance need to be provided. Uh, this is intended to be a reference of the UP community. So which means that it can be used for decision making by the uh, university officials uh, and even the building administrators and residents of the uh, UP community. So we are looking forward to the uh, distribution and launch of this biodiversity management handbook. So to sum up uh, what I have uh, the uh, my short presentation. So the current state of the management of UP Diliman is uh, far from ideal. No, there remains a need to support the improvement of expansion of the university's urban forest management through capacity building in the form of equipment manpower and technical knowledge so actually uh, uh, right now uh, we have a limited scope in terms of the areas that we can manage you know? so the UP Arboretum is basically uh, something that we have not uh, managed that much or provided uh, attention that much so we have uh, thus far, uh, so far focused on uh, the areas uh, of the core and the surrounding the academic core you know? So that could be a prospect. And then uh, in terms of policy, so while there are a lot of beneficial, uh, a number of beneficial policies so far, there are also some that uh, are seemingly questionable to say the least, no? especially some of the recent ones. But um, in spite of that, uh, we are looking forward and uh, moving forward. So th this I am sure of because I know of some examples where uh, we can see that uh, the university is trying to step forward a better way of managing uh, the campus as an urban forest and the uh, campus uh, natural environment in general. So in 2019, uh, the Board of Regents approved the creation of the Diliman Environmental Management Office so to ensure the environmental compliance and protection of campus biodiversity, among others. You know. So there is now a dedicated office that will handle the environmental uh, concerns of the university. And then uh, there is also an anticipated creation of standing committees on the campus environment that will utilize the expertise of UP Diliman faculty members in creating policy and guiding decision making on cam campus environmental concerns. So the picture there is actually not the standing committee yet. So that's uh, members of the technical working group on biodiversity management, who's the, per the people behind the biodiversity management handbook. But uh, basically what we want to uh, show is that uh, the university has the uh, resources to create uh, collaborative um, uh, groups like this, you know, that uh, harnesses the expertise of different disciplines to uh, assist in the decision making. So, and uh, we've seen it succeed in the Technical Working Group for Biodiversity Management. And we are very excited to uh, welcome the standing committee that will be uh, created by Chancellor Nemenzo. Uh, we see that it will be very helpful in uh, uh, decision making when it comes to environmental concerns. And then of course, uh, we have the UP Diliman Biodiversity Management Handbook which is expected to build the community's unity in the protection of biodiversity, especially in our campus's green spaces. And uh, of course, uh, because the UP community is not really exclusive to uh, the organic members like the employees and the officials, the faculty and the students. So uh, we recognize the continuing efforts of uh, other members of the community and even friends of the UP community to promote knowledge and appreciation and preference for uh, native flora. So one example would be the PNPCSI and the 
UP Wild, who organizes three walks, which are really uh, wonderful learning experiences and uh, develop uh, ni, uh, care for nature. No? No, hindi ka lang natututo about the different uh, things that you can see in the environment uh, of UP, but you also learn to appreciate them and uh, develop, uh, uh, develop the passion to protect them as well. So um, that ends my presentation. And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your uh, uh, comments in, uh, as we move along with our uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, James. Uh, maraming salamat, no? Nakakamiss makapasok ulit sa campus ng UP. Lalo na, no, very green. At the same time, this is, has some tipong um, pulling effect, no? Yan. Okay. So for our next speaker, he is currently a research associate in the Biodiversity Research Laboratory, Institute of Biology, University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is a graduate of DS Life Sciences, specializing in ecology and systematics from Ateneo de Manila University, and has recently finished his Master's of Science in Plant and Fungal Taxonomy, Diversity and Conservation from Queen Mary University of London and the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q in 2020. Under the Shevding Scholarship, he is the brain behind Clerodendrum EH, a citizen science project which documented Clerodendrum species belonging to mint family. Currently, he is the vice president and programs committee head of the Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society Incorporated. Without further ado, let's hear it from Mr. David Justin Pless on urban forests and native trees, nature walks, and public engagement with science. Take it away, David. Okay, thank you, Diane, uh, for that warm welcome. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So uh, as Diane said, I'm David Pless. I am a member of the Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society Incorporated. I also work with the UP Diliman Institute of Biology. And I'm here to talk to you guys today about uh, urban forests and native trees. I'm going to share a little bit about how our organization uh, does its tree walks, what tree walks are, and uh, how we engage the public with science. So the two main questions that I'm going to be uh, addressing today are basically this first one, which is why is it important to have native trees in urban areas? And majority of my talk is actually going to focus on the second question, which is how do we communicate uh, this information or these va uh, this, this value to the public? So the organization I work with, PNPCSI, is the premier nonprofit, non-government organization in the Philippines that advocates for uh, conservation and sustainable use of native flora and their habitats. So um, our founder, uh, the great Filipino botanist Leonard Ko, was famous for his encyclopedic knowledge of uh, the native flora of the Philippines and for his passion, his very intense passion, uh, in sharing everything that he knew to other people. So he loved to invite uh, your regular average everyday citizens up into the forests for three treks. And his dream was to reconnect people with their natural heritage. So this dream is a legacy that PNPCSI continues today with its three walks. So for Sir Leonard, it was very easy to explain uh, all the different reasons why native flora are important in our forests and in their natural habitats. But why should we have native flora in our urban parks and in our green spaces here in the city? So there are a couple of reasons which I'm going to go through really quickly. Um, uh, one or the first reason is uh, ecology because native flora have uh, unique relationships with uh, different fauna in our country, birds, bats, and insects. And these relationships have been uh, in the making for millions of years. And it's important that we preserve these relationships, allow them to continue so that uh, we can continue to derive the benefits of the ecosystem services from the habitats that these species reside in. So another uh, reason to look at having native species in our urban spaces is connectivity. 
So one of the big problems with conservation nowadays is that because of development, so you have uh, creation of residential areas, mining, uh, etc., agriculture, uh, the number of natural habitats uh, in our country is dwindling and these uh, ecosystems are also shrinking and becoming less connected. And when this happens, the natural processes that maintain them and that we benefit from uh, have a hard time uh, continuing. So for example, uh, plants might be separated from their pollinators or animals might have a hard time you know, finding enough food in their home range and being able to reproduce finding partners, et cetera. So it's important that we have these native flora in our green spaces so that these green spaces can act as kind of corridors to connect forest fragments. This picture here uh, was uh, shared to me by my friend Alistair, who's working with the Antipolo Valley Ecological Society, or AVES, and they're working to keep uh, Antipolo Valley's green spaces connected with the greater Shara Madre region. And then the last uh, reason to have native species in our urban parks is actually more for us than for the species. It's for our ability to really recognize and to see them. So it's important to see native flora in, in the city because it makes them more real for the average citizen. The best example for this, I think, is our uh, national tree, the Nara tree. Um, a lot of people have, I mean, uh, school children, for instance, are aware that the Nara tree exists. A lot of people even know what the scientific name for Nara is. But if you ask them uh, to go outside and point out a Nara tree to you, some of them would not even know what it looks like. So it's important for us to take these very abstract concepts of ecosystems and species and uh, threatened species and to make them more real and more tangible for people. And one way we can do that is to bring them closer, to bring to, to have them in our uh, cities, in our urban green spaces. So um, that, that knowledge of that value is something that the NPCSI uh, regularly shares to the public. There are different ways that we engage the public in these issues. So uh, for instance, we have a lot of seminars, we have workshops where we talk about uh, basic taxonomy of plants, uh, how to do forest restoration, uh, and native ornamental species. Now that we're in the pandemic, uh, it's a little harder for us to, to uh, convene groups, so we're doing webinars. Uh, there are also opportunities to do tree planting activities. So if you guys have ever volunteered before for a tree planting cause, you would know about this. And then there are citizen science uh, ventures where you can engage the public to contribute to scientific research by uh, collecting data, or monitoring uh, certain species or habitats in their areas. Those are all great ways to engage the public, and these are things that PNPCSI does. But today, I'm going to be talking specifically about our three walks or and in, uh, in relation to uh, the field trips that we hold. So basically, any field trip, any stroll through any part of the city can become a tree walk if you have somebody to guide you and somebody to tell you all about the trees that you encounter. So uh, tree walks are PNPCSI's signature offering. This is what our organization is probably best known for. And it's one of our uh, simplest and most effective ways to communicate our advocacy, which is basically the, the wonder and the value of native flora. So uh, in 2019, we had an opportunity to do this actually with the UP uh, Institute of Tourism uh, through the Lahad Gunita uh, program in which uh, we hosted regular three walks at the UP Biology Threatened Species Arboretum. Uh, that was like every Thursday for about two months. And it really picked up and it was a great experience for all of us, for PNPCSI, for UP Biology. And uh, there, there was a lot that we were able to share with many different groups of people about native trees. So three walks are something that you can do with a group as small as three to five people. You can do it with a group of like a hundred people. We've done a we've done tree walks in Araceros Forest Park where we have four groups of 20 people each. And you can uh, kind of like customize these or tailor these experiences to the different groups that you'll be touring. So for instance, you could work with students, you could have tree walks with uh, seniors, with families, with kids. So uh, there's lots of different ways to to do a tree walk and lots of different places where you can do it so off the top of my head why is it so great that we're doing these tree walks like what is the benefit of having a tree walk or joining a tree walk 
So first off, uh, three walk is holistic exercise. You are exercising your mind, but also your body. It's a great way to lose weight. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's a leisurely thing. There's no pressure for you to answer a quiz at the end of the experience. There's uh, no necessary output, unlike a formal citizen science project. You're literally just taking a walk in the park. And this is something that you can do to relax, to reconnect with nature, to get your mind off the different stresses of you know, living in the city. Uh, so yeah, there's that. And also, one great thing about three walks is that they are a very sensory experience. So as I mentioned earlier, it's about taking people pulling them away from like uh, textbook concepts and these very abstract ideas and making it all very visual in front of them and very tangible, very proximate and urgent, like happening right now. Because being able to touch the trees, feel the bark, smell the flowers helps people remember what they're learning. And it, you know, it really makes for an experience that they can't forget. I, I can guarantee you that nobody who's ever had to pry open a fig fruit to find all these fig wasps inside crawling out I guarantee nobody's going to forget that experience. So uh, PNCSI does tree walks in a particular way. Um, usually we have to start by preparing certain logistics and legalities, so if there are necessary permits, and then we have to spread the word online. So we have publicity materials and sign-up sheets for people to join our tree walks. Some of our veteran uh, tree walkers, tree walk guides, you can blindfold them and then drop them in the middle of any city and they'll look around and know exactly what to say about trees, know where to find uh, interesting native trees. Me, I'm a bit more OC with the way I do tree walks. I absolutely have to have like a guide prepared with me. I have to have a map and like locations of the native trees because it, it really helps with the the, the stress and nervousness of public speaking. So sometimes we do an ocular, we, we go scouting for native trees in an area. It's really funny because sometimes our native tree walks end up becoming non-native tree walks because um, in, in the city, it's actually pretty common to find non-native, exotic, or even invasive species. So instead of being able to point out well-known native species, we're like, ah, that akasha is not native, or um, that mango tree is actually not native. So it's, it's, an, it's a, trying to find a needle in a haystack sometimes to find nice native trees, but they're there. They're definitely there. So there's a lot of matter loading that goes into that preparation. Uh, we have some regular spots that we like to tree walk because we're very familiar with the area and what it has to offer in terms of native trees. So for instance, there's the Threatened Species Arboretum in UP Institute of Biology. It's basically five plant communities in one because the way that EDC designed the uh, the arboretum is that it showcases different forest formations from uh, across the Philippines. So, for instance, there are limestone forests, there are uh, lowland dipter harp forests, there are ultramafic forests, and you can see all of those inside the UP arboretum. Uh, it's it's one of the things we want to impress on people that you know not all forests are the same. Not every group of trees is a is the same kind of forest. Uh, there's also Nino Aquino Parks and Wildlife Center, which you know is very proud to say that it's a protected area within the city. There's the Leonard Co. Garden of Native Plants inside, uh, which we often visit, or we, well, we did pre-pandemic. <laughs> and then there's the Arosaros Forest Park, which is the last green lung of Manila. PNPCSI is often there for like Earth Day celebration type events, but uh, we also played an important role in the Save Arroceros movement to you know, protect Arroceros from being turned into a gymnasium. So uh, once we've done all the prep work and we're actually having the tree walk now, we begin every tree walk with an orientation. So we want to manage expectations for people, help them you know, figure out what it is they're here for and what they're supposed to, to feel or to expect from the experience. So we want to set the tone. It's supposed to be casual, it's supposed to be fun, and you're just supposed to enjoy and learn a lot. And then you level off with all the participants. So you discuss what they know, what their background is, and where they're coming from. Uh, one of the things that we always start with is the concept of plant blindness. So we know that a lot of people you know, think plants are pretty, but uh, sometimes it's hard to push past that. So people treat plants as like wallpaper or background. They make good backgrounds for your photo ops. but Sometimes people see that you know the plants they're all the same when in fact they're not. 
So once we establish that idea and then we tell them that, okay, we're here to help alleviate your plant blindness, we talk about some of the trees that they might be familiar with already. And often they'll say things like, oh, I know about mango or I know about uh, aratides. And then this is where we uh, bring in the reality that a lot of these trees that they might be familiar with, even if they have Filipino sounding names, might actually not be native to the Philippines. So we go into the different terminology that you would use on a biodiversity walk, uh, native, endemic, exotic, invasive. We clarify all these things at the beginning. So we're all on the same page. Then the tree walk proper is basically a process of just walking around, uh, pointing out the native trees, identifying them, and relating them to something that people uh, participating in the tree walk might be familiar with already. And then uh, educating them, giving them like, uh, fun facts and tidbits about the species. So this is an opportunity for us to actually deliver bite-sized pieces of science to people. So there's a lot of plant conservation, plant diversity science that you deliver in small packages to people so that they can digest it properly and you know enjoy the experience and still come off learning something and not being overwhelmed. So we do talk about nomenclature, uh, common names and scientific names, why it's important to have scientific names in the first place. Uh, plant families so that they're able to group these things in, you know, in their mind. Uh, people are surprised when we say, oh, molave, which is a huge tree, is actually also related to your regular kitchen ingredients like basil and oregano. So it, it helps people like form associations and retain concepts and ideas. Then we talk about ecology. We talk about uh, the different habitats where these native trees can be found, where they can be found in the Philippines. So their distribution, that's biogeography then lots of ecological interactions between different plants and animals. And then after that, there's uh, other fun facts. So their economic uses, which species is used to create uh, resin or gum, which species uh, is used to make, sorry, excuse me, uh, musical instruments, uh, cultural value, which tree was mentioned by so-and-so president in their speech in 19 Kuapong Kuapong. Uh, other trivia, which species can you find on the five peso coins? So there are lots of things to learn, and we, we really intend for it not to be too overwhelming. It's more of just fun facts. So here are some photos of the three walks we've done. We have Araceros Forest Park. We have UP IB Threatened Species Arboretum, the uh, Dipteroharp area. There's UST, where we had our most recent symposium, and then also Quezon Memorial Circle. So yeah, uh, now I can actually tell you guys a little bit about some of the native trees that you might be seeing in these parks and urban forests. So for instance, from top to bottom, you have uh, Nara with its uh, golden blossoms and you have your Alagao uh, or Premna odorata. You have lots of different kinds of fig trees. Uh, this one in particular is Ficus nota, so that's your tibig. And then your talisay, which could also be our national tree, because you can find it everywhere. Every parking lot has a talisay tree. You have your um, other botanical beauties, like your bagawak morado or clerodendron quadrilocularia. You have the, the very delicate blossoms of the banaba and the multicolored trunks of bagras. Bagras or eucalyptus diglupta is the only eucalyptus that's native to the northern hemisphere. In the Philippines, it's native to Mindanao, but you can also see it in some of our uh, parks and uh, streets. And then you have uh, trees like Balit Bitan, which have really uh, interesting or colorful foliage that make for good landscaping trees. Then you have lots of herbs and shrubs and uh, flowering trees. You have the Mali Mali there, the red one, then two different kinds of Katmon. You have uh, Delanya Filipinensis, which is the white one, and then Luzoniensis, which is the yellow one, or Malakatmon. You have Ipil, which is different from Ipil Ipil, and people are always surprised to find this out during our three walks. Ipil is native, uh, Ipil Ipil is non-native, so there's a lot to, to see and to learn here. Um, once we finish going through all the trees, there's always got to be a big finish at the end, so we have to end with kind of a bang. You have to context contextualize everything that you've seen and then you have to leave your mark on the participants. So usually during this portion, we tell them about how what you've seen today is just a very teeny tiny fraction of all of the real diversity in the Philippines, the 10,000 uh, native species that we have. And uh, we depend on all of these native species and their habitats for all of our needs, food, water, medicine, construction materials, even the air we breathe. Then we talk a little bit about how 
Um, even though we depend on all of these species, they're also very under threat. And the Philippines is actually a biodiversity hotspot. And you know, there are lots of questions about, oh, what is our government doing about all of this? And you know, that's always a fun discussion, very extensive and sometimes very serious discussion. So we, we like to end with the idea that it's our uh, responsibility to protect this natural heritage and to actually to, to uh, empower and hold accountable our leaders to focus on these environmental issues, to elect leaders who have these issues at heart. So what has PNPCSI learned exactly from doing all these three walks? So what are the patterns we've seen? Uh, one is that people are in fact interested in trees and in three walks. There is a huge market for that. You would think it's something very nerdy that people wouldn't be interested in, but that's not true. As long as you hold a tree walk and let people know, they will come. Uh, one time we had tree walk, uh, a tree walk in Araceros Forest Park, and on the day itself, it was raining, but the hundreds of people who signed up for the event still showed up, you know, in rain boots and raincoats and everything. So people want to do this. They want to see the trees. Uh, second is learning goes both ways. So it's not just that the guides are teaching the participants, we're also, the guides are also learning from the participants. So everybody has something to share about their personal experiences, how they grew up with native trees. And I think one of the best uh, instances of this happening was that time that PNPCSI was able to conduct a uh, tree walk with uh, LUMAD students. So I'm sure that they had, uh, the, the PNPCSI had a lot to share, like scientific information, but the LUMADs also had something to share uh, with them about how uh, native trees factor into their lives and into uh, their communities. And the last, which is very heartening, especially in these, uh, in this particular, in these particular times, is the fact that people do care. So it's, it's really, it restores your faith in humanity to find that people actually have a desire to know more, to do more, and to see change happening. Uh, the, the reality that we always say at the end of every tree walk is that people protect what they love, but they can't love what they don't know. So the very first step is always uh, awareness, uh, knowledge, showing people what they've been missing, what's been in front of them this whole time that they weren't seeing, curing that plant blindness. Um, when you, it, it's important we have na native trees in cities and also tree walks in the cities, because otherwise, like these species, these uh, ecosystems seem very far off. They seem not related to us at all and to our busy city, city lives. You see this photo above that was taken in Antipolo. You can see uh, there's an Antipolo tree actually there in the, in, uh, in the green area. And then you can see the city far back in the distance. And it almost feels like these things are not our problem. Conservation is not our problem. It's someone else's problem to fix. But the reality is it's not. It's, it's everybody's responsibility and everybody plays a role in conservation and benefits from our native species. So this is something that three walks open people up to. And at the end of every three walk, everybody just has a great time. I've never ever done a three walk where somebody was like, wow, that was a waste of time. I wish I didn't spend two hours on that. Um, everybody always has a, has a fantastic time. We take photos, everybody's beaming and smiling, even though it rained or they're covered in mud. So you know, people are happy to be out there uh, in nature. So three walks are definitely something that we should be doing more. So yeah, that's basically the end of my discussion. Uh, if you want to talk to PNPCSI about, PNPCSI about native trees or about three walks, especially when it's no longer a health hazard to do so, you can reach us here through these uh, addresses and uh, you can find us on Facebook as well. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's it. Thank you, David. I think parang magkakilala ata tayo dahil din sa tree walk mo. Sa Los Baños. Yeah. <laughs> I've met so many people through tree walks and I really enjoy it. If, if uh -oh. Whether you're an introvert who likes, you know, science stuff by themselves or like an extrovert who just loves to mingle with people, tree walks are the thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Salamat, okay. Um, dadako na po tayo, no, doon sa pinaka-interesting part then of the webinar, which is yung question and answer. So, meron po, pero before we answer, no, yung questions po, um, shout out muna doon sa mga uh, uh, viewers natin sa Facebook Live. Maraming salamat po sa pakikiisa ninyo at pagdalo nyo dito sa aming webinar. Lalong-lalo na po din sa mga aming current grantees, si Dr. Denise Matias, 
Podcast, si, um, si na Miss Abby and Miss Trine Catcon ng The Atene Wild, at saka syempre po si Miss Cynthia Are. Okay. So, yan. So, we have some questions po, no? So, from Facebook, um, do you have a training program for guides on forest baiting? Um, sa kasalukuyan po, no, we recently signed an MOU with DNRB and BAIETN pala. And uh, what we're after is to craft an urban forest baiting program. Part of the program would be um, identifying um, what are the activities that can be supported? What are the um, exercises or um, uh, that can be integrated? As well as uh, what kind of capacity building or capability building is needed for the forest baiting guides to conduct or to facilitate such exercises or such program? Sa uh, experience po kasi ng um, Japan as well as Korea, they have this... Uh, a uh, dedicated po no, na um, practitioner on forest painting. So they should have a medical background and then syempre rin po no, they should have in, um, information about, about the different species that would be, can be found within that specific area. Yeah. Okay. Um, question po no, siguro kay David, uh, what are the challenges in public engagement? Uh, lalo na doon sa, ano, sa tree walks. Uh, well, I mean, I guess the most obvious challenge is scheduling because uh, people really do have to find time to go out and have a tree walk. I mean, it doesn't take that long. You can do a tree walk anywhere between 30 minutes to two hours. But uh, the way, you know, life is spaced in the city, People sometimes have to move mountains to make uh, time for themselves to be able to do tree walks. And I guess there's also a distinct lack of green spaces to be able to do it. So, you know, um, we have a couple of choice spots for our tree walks, but it would be better if, you know, every city, every major city had some great green park that people could visit. And we can hold lots of tree walks there. So I think it's uh, accessibility of these uh, green spaces and also uh, s scheduling issues. Oh, and well, of course, we need to have more tree guides. So uh, we need more Leonard Coes out there uh, to, to teach people about native trees. Yeah. Oh, uh, actually, I know, you know one of the things that I appreciate you know, uh, with uh, UP Diliman is that yun nga, na, gaya na nabanggit mo kanina, nagkaroon ng programa before yung sa tourism, college of tourism ba yun? So, encourage no, paano, um, paano, tama, paano ba to carry out yung actual na guiding or yung tree walk. Siguro follow up dun sa, ano, dun sa question, ano yung most memorable experience mo when you had uh, tree walks or when you conduct tree walks? Ano yung most memorable na ano, experience? Like a particular singular experience or like a recurring experience? Uh, or my recurring experience ba? <laughs> sorry, because I, okay, like off the top of my head, I'm thinking about the time that like the chancellor randomly popped up in the three walk. So like we had to three walk the chancellor. Actually, that may not have been random. He probably requested it. But, you know, uh, getting to meet people in the three walks in general. So there's so many different kinds of people you meet from different backgrounds. I love that part of three walks. Um, also standing next to Sir Leonard Coe's memorial in the Threatened Species Arboretum and kind of just invoking that spirit, you know, to, to talk about native trees in front of people and to, you know, kind of fight to convince them that it's something worth their time, their energy. That's for every three walk guide, I think that's that's a moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David, for sharing that. Um Kay James naman. Um dito. Ano yung um uh, pinaka memorable din na experience mo managing yung um Diliman campus. I mean, meron ba meron na rin bang mga nagme-message sa iyo bakit ano uh, bakit kailangan po tuloy yung mga ganitong puno and then parang paano ni na-handle ng office yung mga ganung interests. Ah, uh, 
Well, uh, ilang beses din nangyari sa amin yon na kailangan namin magpaliwanag. And basically, yun talaga yung kailangan gawin. So you have to uh, explain na yung ginagawa namin ay hindi naman dahil gusto lang namin gawin to kundi dahil uh, uh, in an institution like UP, unfortunately, uh, kailangan nating balansihin din yung ano eh, yung... Uh, Uh, pag-protect doon sa ating natural environment versus yung safety. You know? And most of the times, uh, when we uh, come to the point na kailangan namin magputol or magprone, it is often times due to safety concerns. No? So uh, bumabawi na lang kami by uh, trying our best to uh, yun nga, implement yung guidelines on tree planting and also try to provide uh, inputs whenever... Uh, Uh, a new development is being created para hindi na maulit yung mga uh, situations that would uh, not be favorable to the growth of our trees and uh, will eventually pose as uh, safety threats to the community. Okay. Thank you, James. Girl, ano, follow-up question. Um, in terms of, kasi yun nga, no, nabanggit mo rin kanina, marami din din sa mga species that can be found in um, Diliman Campus ay non-native or exotic species. Are there plans to replace yung mga exotic species with the native species? Actually, sa ngayon, uh, yun na yung uh, standard na ginagawang practice, especially for new developments. And I can also say na yung mga ilang mga bumigay na mga puno through natural reasons, like kalimbawa yung mga na-fruit dahil sa pag uh, pag uh, bagyo o kaya naman ay yung na disturb dahil nga sa ma unfortunately ay dahil sa mga new developments din ang mga pinapalit na natin dito ay mga native trees and even yung mga gustong mag uh, conduct ng tree planting activities nirerequire talaga namin na uh, uh, native trees lang yung itanim nila so binibigay namin yung listahan na nabanggit ko kanina of more than 190 native species and uh, kailangan isa lang doon o oh, yung uh, ilalagay nila or i-donate nila sa university. Okay. Thank you at uh, thank you James and thank you David no for answering um some of the questions. I think um we'll go na dun sa mga uh, nabanggit niyo kanina any mga key messages that we want to impart to our audience at this time. So for under urban forest and biodiversity Urban forests and trees in the cities provide multiple benefits, not just to the people, but also to, bi to the biodiversity. Urban forests aren't devoid of challenges in terms of maintenance and institutional factors. Urban forests need regular tree care development and maintenance. Uh, tree planting activities should be planned carefully to ensure that the plants and the community around it will thrive. And you can't just plant trees anywhere in any time. Oh, hindi na po ito yung panahon na para magtanim tayo ng uh, kung ano yung available, but rather mas purposive kung ano yung dapat natin itanim. We should harness the different expertise of community members in developing, maintaining, and growing our urban forests. And um, native flora are important in our urban parks because of its unique relationship with fauna in the country, connectivity of ecological habitats, and recognition of its importance. Seminars, workshops, tree growing activities, and citizen science ventures may be done to engage the public in the protection, conservation, and management of urban forests. And lastly, a uh, tree walk is a good way to communicate, discover, learn the wonder and value of the native flora, holistically, leisurely, and sensory. Okay. So no, um, here are some of the initiatives of the foundation that are linked with the urban biodiversity, forests, and health concepts. In partnership with Haribon Foundation, I think this is the one wherein uh, David joined us. Uh, we were able to support the treaties, tree, trek, and tag, the project maps, some of the green spaces and metro generated the native tree key and facilitated tree tagging in CCP, Luneta Park, and Camp Aguinaldo Grandstand. Um, the foundation also, in partnership with Alliance for a Safe, Sustainable, and Resilient Environment, published the Public Parks, Open, and Green Spaces, which is a guidebook for NBI planners and landscape developers. This can be downloaded in our website.
other publications are the Forest Blooms Journal and the Forest Reflections Journal in partnership with a talented watercolor artist and graphic designer who is in the audience, Ms. Cynthia Bozon Ari. The journals provided a step-by-step -step guide in making tree illustrations, basics in identifying birds and trees. And if I had these journals when I was in college, perhaps I could get good grades in forest taxonomy. But kidding aside, this journal, especially the Forest Reflections Journal, is extra special in a sense that in this time of uncertainty and with the pandemic going on, we can find solace in nature. This journal can help us to be more attentive to the things that we may have been missing out. When was the last time you heard a cicada or found the different birds other than Maya and know that Nara has started blooming or tapos nang magbloom, di ba? Yeah. So as shared by David earlier, the foundation, as a member of Green Forest Restoration Initiative Network, organizes tree walks for the BFF trails. Prior to the pandemic, we were able to support tree walks and BFF trails in Lipidiliman Campus and La Mesa Eco Park. For me, it's fascinating to know that dipter harps and other native tree species can survive in the Lipidiliman Campus grounds. Any forest conservation action should put science at the forefront act of noticing and knowing will help appreciate urban biodiversity and urban forests. But this should not stop there. On June 5, in celebration of World Environment Day, our partner, the Ateneo Wild, will be launching a citizen science manual. The Ateneo Wild is a city science project that aims to document the urban biodiversity in the Ateneo Loyola Heights campus. Similar efforts are being done in UP Diliman, and hopefully, through the manual, we can inspire campus-led actions and citizen scientists who can document our urban biodiversity. You may follow their page at www.facebook.com slash the Ateneo Wild. So we had an interesting discussion today, and we hope that we were able to provide you with information about urban forests, urban biodiversity, and how we as individuals can contribute to the protection and conservation of our urban forests. If you are a member of an organization or happen to know one, we encourage you to visit our website and let's start the conversation. To recap, here are some of the activities that can be supported by the foundation. Mapping and assessment of forest bathing or therapy areas, mapping and assessment of zoonotic threats and risks, conservation and development of green spaces in urban areas, feasibility studies and developing forest bathing therapy as an ecotourism package and a community-based enterprise, forging partnerships with stakeholders and various sectors, capacity building and management plan. Knowledge management systems, communications, and advocacy on promotion of forest and health. So you may submit your proposal through our grants portal at www.grants.forestfoundation.ph. And for grant inquiries, you may send us an email to proposals at forestfoundation.ph, or you may visit our website at www.forestfoundation.ph. For those who will be needing a certificate of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation form through this link, bit.ly slash understory 5 feedback. Before we officially close our webinar, let's hear from our speakers their final message for all of us to continue the work and inspiration for the urban forests and urban biodiversity. Let's start off with landscape architectures. Uh, again, thank you very much for having me in this uh, very interesting and uh, uh, wonderful learning activity. So we hope that organizations like the Forest Foundation Philippines, the Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society, and maybe some of our uh, members of the audience uh, this afternoon will continue their passionate work in promoting knowledge of and appreciation of our urban forests and our urban biodiversity. So we learn a lot from your work. And many members of the UP community, including our officials, are listening. So we look forward to many more productive partnerships with you. Thank you, James. Now let's hear from Mr. David Bless. Hi, uh, so I was thinking of what to say for this portion. And I guess what I just really want to impress on everybody is that now more than ever, the, Phil the Philippines needs more Leonard Coe's, more 
uh, botanists and plant uh, enthusiasts out there, uh, plant conservationists who uh, are willing to share their passion and share their interest and knowledge in native trees with people. So you have to strike while the iron is hot. The moment that we are allowed to go back out and it's safe and you know people have been vaccinated properly, um, people will be dying to be in nature's embrace and to be under the trees again. So uh, we're looking forward to that day. And I'm hoping that when that day comes, people will be interested to join us uh, to learn about our advocacy and to, to tree walk with us, basically. Yeah, I agree with you, David. No? I can't wait to have this pandemic over para naman makabisita na tayo sa mga green spaces natin. Thank you. Um, Cities and nature are not separate, and so are we in this entangled environment. No act is too small. Let's all work together to make our cities more livable with trees, green spaces, and biodiversity. Thanks once again to James and David, and of course to our friends and viewers today. See you in our next Understory session. Thank you. Thank you.